Hi everybody, I'm back. Okay, let's try this again. All right. Hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for coming along and trying to get connected with Miss Eden here. Sending her an invitation. she is hi <laughs> hi <laughs> how are you good 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 you look gorgeous thank you for joining us thank you you look lovely how are you I'm wonderful um how are things in alaska well um the snow's melting off but we're not holding our breath with that it's just came a little early this year <laughs> yeah good, 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 good well i am elated to have you and star and all these wonderful people who are joining us from alaska and everywhere else to um engage with us as we have this conversation about trauma therapy and trauma therapy specifically around the sexual trauma so for those of you who don't know about this effort i'm april levine garrett and I'm the president of Amplify America. It is a movement and at this current iteration of podcasts that highlights people affected by social issues, the advocates and experts who are helping to ameliorate those issues and discussing a number of tenable solutions that we can all do, um, engage in to come together to try to ameliorate those problems. So I'm really excited about having this conversation today with Eden. Um, I'm also very grateful for the conversations I've been able to have with people who are involved with sexual violence, healing, and recovery in the state of Alaska, which unfortunately has the highest rates of sexual trauma and sexual violence in the nation. So I'm elated to have this conversation. I've been grateful for the reflections that people have given us about this particular episode of Amplify America on sexual violence and sexual trauma. If you haven't listened to it yet, I encourage you to go to wherever you engage your podcast to um, take a listen. It's a lengthy episode. You might need to listen to it in parts and that's fine. Um, and I encourage you also to share it um, for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, because I think there's a lot of misinformation about sexual assault, sexual violence, sexual harassment, and sexual trauma. And this interview is just so filled with incredible de defining information um, about those categories, but also um, a powerful firsthand account from someone who um, is a survivor of sexual assault, Blaze Bell, and I talked with her earlier this week, um, who gives her incredible personal story around what happened to her and also how she's recovering from it. And she's doing some amazing work, including with um, STAR standing together against rape, um, the organization that we highlighted in this particular issue on Wednesday, I will be talking with their executive director, Kaylee Olson, about the work that she's been doing in that community. That organization is over 40 years old in that community and how they're expanding. So I really encourage you to go back if you haven't and listen to that particular episode. In addition to that, I encourage you to share it with other people. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time so that we can try to clarify some things and get you connected with organizations and materials that will be helpful to you. So. Um, just wanted to give that background information. Um, if you have any questions during our conversation, feel free to put them in the comment section and I'll try, we'll try to give you some live time response. But for now, I'm just going to have a general conversation with Eden to uh, see how she felt about the interview um, and also to kind of go over some of the main uh, themes that we discussed because I wanted to bring that to kind of a live conversational um, uh, exchange with people because this aspect of getting over, getting through um, trauma, especially trauma of a sexual nature, I think is very difficult for a lot of people to kind of understand, um, to comprehend, and to believe that is, that is even possible, you know? And so I think this is, a, it was a very important piece of pulling together this episode. And I was really grateful when Keely was like, oh my God, you have to talk to our trauma therapist because that is a huge part of the work that we do 
and even more encouraged when Blaze said in our Instagram live that she went back to star an organization that had helped her when she was 19 um, to talk to them about filling in some of those gaps with regard to not just the immediate aftermath of something like this that happens, but also um, when dealing with the long-term effects of sexual violence and sexual trauma. So um, I hope that you will engage that space. Um, I'm grateful that you guys are here for this conversation. Feel free to give us feedback along the way, and I'm just going to jump into it. So Eden, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Eden Lunsford is a uh, licensed uh, counselor and a trauma therapist who is a specialist. Um, she is um, a particular specialist with regard to brain spotting, something I've been able to experience um, because of her generosity, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, she's worked around trauma for many, many decades at this point and has dedicated her life to this and has an incredible uh, understanding of it, but also the ways in which she knows how it shows up in the body and in the brain and also how it shows up in our day-to-day -day interactions with each other. It's, it was a really fascinating conversation. So we're going to get into that now. So one, I wanted to just start with you to see how you felt about the interview, what kind of feedback you got about it and um, what it, how it showed up for you. It was a wonderful interview and I was really just glad to um, engage in, in conversation about these different things um, regarding healing and um, regarding just what what it looks like for a person who's been um, through um, a traumatic experience such as sexual trauma. Yeah. Um, some of the feedback that I got from people included, I didn't realize that some of the things that she brought up would be how people would respond to experiencing sexual trauma, um, not being able to engage in activities that they normally would be, and that lack of safety that people feel in normative you know, ways in which they interact. And so I thought that was really interesting and, and that people brought that up to me was significant. So I wanted to kind of re-engage you on the question of how does sexual trauma affect people in their mind and in their body? If you could kind of talk a little bit about what that like really shows up as and, and, and how it presents. Okay. Um, some of the things that bring people into therapy um, would be things of what you're uh, what we're talking about here is is those symptoms that show up for people um intrusive symptoms such as um having nightmares um, having panic attacks um avoidance type symptoms as far as just not being able to tolerate being in certain places and around certain individuals or even sometimes even certain smells um, negative alteration to um, an individual's like mood um, or their cognitions, just kind of getting into those like negative spirals um, is, is another way it can show up and uh, arousal reactivity. And that's, and that has to do with maybe being um, hypervigilant in certain circumstances or sometimes just the absolute absolute opposite being just completely checked out or numb um, around certain things as well. I mean, Those if are I'm just on the side of this looking in, I'm a friend of someone, I'm a loved one of someone who has experienced this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what if I'm experiencing someone who's had a loss of interest in things that they want to do or don't feel that, that kind of safety, what should I be trying to consider when I'm interacting with someone who's been through this as, as how I can be you know, a source of support for them? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it has a lot to do with um, the level of rapport you have with somebody. If it's a, you know, your best friend and it's your sister, it's, it's somebody close to you, then you have a little bit more of an ability to maybe approach certain conversations. Um, if you're not that close to a person, then it just, being really just available and just letting them know, um, you know, I can tell you've been through something and I don't know what it is and you don't have to tell me, but I want you to know I care about you a lot. And if there's anything I can do to help, I want to be that person that can help. When, you know, I think you and, and Keely both talked about it and, and I think Blaze displayed it in her story and her telling about how she dealt. Um, 
it can be very jarring for someone, especially someone who's dealing with a sexual trauma, to just live out day-to-day -day activities. And um, something as simple as someone coming into their space, even if that, that person is somebody that they trust on a day-to-day, -day, that reactivity. Can you talk a little bit about how coaching and, and therapy and even advice lines or, or hotlines help people get through some of the more challenging aspects of how to navigate it? Um, I think that um, each of those are wonderful resources um, for a person. I think that the most important um, aspect um, from those um, different resources would be the normalizing of those different symptoms that they're experiencing. Um, just somebody to let them know that, you know what, it doesn't have to make sense. We just have to be here right now and uh, just take a few moments to reground and then we can we can move on to the next thing. It's, it's really a matter of uh, a person being able to uh, have access to people or access to different resources that are going to help them feel like this. It's not a me thing. This is something that happened. Um, and I'm just this is my body dealing with it the best way it knows how. You did a really good job um, in the interview of telling us like what happens in someone's brain and then also how that trauma is held in someone's body when something like this happens. I think it's important for those of us who are survivors, but it's also very important for people who love and care for us to understand that our brains in some ways and our bodies in many ways are no longer the same. We now have different things that come to us and we experience them in different ways than other people who haven't had that experience. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what has happened to my brain when something like this happens and what is going on in my body when something like this happens? Um, I think that <clears throat> that's, that's where a lot of the misconceptions around sexual trauma come. Um, I think that people who don't know a lot about it will be like, well, that was a terrible, no good, awful thing that happened but that was a long time ago. You should be fine now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's simply not how it is for a trauma survivor. Um, the way it's recorded in, a, in our uh, neurological system, um, you know, I kind of think about it like, you know, in the old days we had records <laughs> and, it, and it was those little grooves in the records that is where the music was stored. Um, and our neurological system obviously is much more complicated than that, but it is, it stays recorded in our neurological system and it shows up in all these different ways for years after when, um, an experience happens. Um, and so it's, it's not as simple as, you know, a memory, a regular kind of a memory, because those regular kind of memories are stored in a, in a much more, um, conducive way for us to be able to utilize them. But trauma is not stored that way. Um, and so that's part of the reason it, it shows up the way it does. Yeah, I, I think that when trauma is dealt with in the immediate aftermath, everybody kind of says, okay, I'm going to try to figure out how to apply loving care as much as I possibly can. Um, some people back off because they may be triggered for things that they have or have not dealt with. Um, but I do think that the long-term impacts of that and the fact that it's not this linear thing where it's like, okay, I've done all of these steps and now it's over, that sometimes these things can kind of reoccur many, many moons down the line after it's happened. Um, how do you explain the process of that to a lay audience and also um, give them tools for understanding how to care for people who are in that space? As far as how it shows up? Um, years shows after up the later. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because it's stored in our neurological system, it is going to be um, activated by all sorts of things that have to do with our neurological system. Um, our brain is set up to, um, as far as with the neo neocortex, it's constantly taking in the information in our environment all the time. Um, and then it interprets like that a... information. Yeah, so it's Pardon? like a scan. Yeah, so it's, like it's constantly scan. scanning. Yeah, it's constantly mm -hmm. scanning our environment for anything that may look, smell, sound, appear, feel, anything resembling danger. Um, and so 
when when you know you're you're uh going through life and going through your day and you know something will come up and you'll be like I am shook what's going on with me I don't know what that is I don't know what why am I feeling this sort of way and when we um investigate it closer we can be like well that was that was a strange smell that you haven't smelled maybe in in you know 20 years and and so we can kind of like you know, figure out where it came from and then and then help your neurological system to process that in such a way that we realize that, that smell in this particular circumstance doesn't mean danger. It's connected to something that used to that, that did mean danger at one point, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anymore. And so um, yeah. just being able to recognize what those things are um, is part of that process. So for every person that you handle in a trauma therapy situation, you are understanding what happens to them enough and, and what those triggers might be to be able to deal with each trigger in a particular way so that when it comes up, you lessen the impact of how it, how it affects them and their lives going forward. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people get um, turned away from maybe wanting to go into trauma therapy because they're like, oh, I'm just gonna be in there and I'm just gonna be talking all the time about this thing. And it's just not how it goes. Um, it's very much, you know, this is what brought you here, but these are the ways it's showing up in your life now. And this is what we're trying to do is, is, is to kind of make it so that the, your experience in the now is feeling more safe. Um, rather than, you know, having these triggers come up and then suddenly we're feeling completely unsafe in a very safe environment. Um, your neurological system hasn't processed it to that point yet. And so that's part of the experience of being in therapy is to be able to process those things so that we can engage in our life the way we want to. Yeah, I like the way that you have said, okay, let's demystify what you think it is. We're not going to sit in my chair or sit on the screen between us and have this conversation where I'm constantly making you retell the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You know, it sounds to me like your desire in helping people is so that they can uncover those things and that they don't have the kind of hold over their lives that, you know, make them have that loss of power, that, that lack of agency. Um, can you explain what kinds of different therapies are especially helpful to people who are survivors of sexual trauma and why? Sure. Um, well, there's the, I mean, we, we want to go towards those things that are empirically supported. We want, you know, uh, uh, to be going towards uh, therapies that, that work. So um, there's all sorts of different ones out there. There's a, uh, cognitive processing therapy, uh, somatic experiencing, um, internal family systems, uh, EMDR. Um, there's brain spotting, which you mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's some other therapies that can be taught and are also very effective and a person can have that be a thing they don't have to do in, in the therapy office. And you know, that's your EFT, that's emotion, um, emotional fo focus therapy, and that involves tapping. Um, all very effective. Um, it really just depends on the client and what they're looking for and the way they'd like to process. Um, there's trauma focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Um, but um, my favorite ones, um, the ones that I use and have been using for over a decade, are those ones um, involving um, connecting um, the somatic experience to the experience the person's been through. Okay, so I want to break this a little bit more down, a little bit more for like lay people. Because I, you know, I've been in therapy for many, many years, so I understand all these terms. But I want to make sure for our audience that they get all of this. So let's start with trauma-based cognitive behavioral therapy. What does that look like? It has to do with um, bringing together the experiences that you remember and, um, and being very focused on processing them in a way um, where they're talking about um, the, the different, um, the, the parts that they remember of that experience and then kind of like bringing together um, those, those pieces because 
traumatic memory is not stored in a way that we're that is is typical or we're used to it would be like writing um writing a big long story on a whole bunch of post-it notes and then sticking those post-it notes to all the different walls in your office and then trying to keep that straight Trauma's, trauma is stored more like that. And so cognitive behavioral would be um, a, a way of kind of bringing those parts of the stories together in a more, uh, just a, a way that makes more sense to your brain. Because each time the brain pulls that file out, it's like a big, you know, a, like, a, like a file just being opened and it kind of goes, Poof. and that's what it's like for a person who is trying to access a traumatic memory each time they access it it's it's being accessed in a different order in a different way and so um that's one of the things that cognitive uh, behavioral therapy or trauma focused uh, cognitive behavioral therapy does i can tell you when you describe that i just have this whole like oh my mm -hmm. god that's exactly what it's like you know it's kind of funny because I think even when I met you, I was doing a particular group of therapies and I was like, you know, I got this cognitive thing down. I can tell you chapter and verse. I can give you the script. But the way we're going to move into the somatic stuff, and I want you to explain what's, you know, somatic is because I don't think that's a, a term that everybody understands. But like, it is one thing to be able to say, this is what happened to me. I have an understanding of what happened to me. This is how I feel about it. To, to be conversant about that, right? And for those of us who are very articulate about it, you don't see the other stuff that's going down. You don't see like, you know, and you know, I'm a Virgo and I'm super A type. So like, I don't have a bunch of folders on my desktop. Right. But to, to live as someone who has complex PTSD, when that, when that file gets out of whack and you're like, wait, how did that file get on my desktop? Or why is it over there? Like it is very disconcerting. So there's a real lived experience of people who are otherwise, you know, sometimes, just really in order, just being like, okay, I'm completely out of whack because this experience is still within me in some way that I haven't really resolved it. And I think that that's such a beautiful way of explaining it, not to not just for people who've experienced it, but pe for people who care about us, because then they can go, oh, I have a visual now, I get it. I, I have this metaphor in my head. So I, when this happens with April or the, when this happens with Eden or anyone else that I love, I know what's happening. So I don't go into the judgment space of like, what's wrong with you? Because you're normally like this. You realize that that person is having that sort of reaction and you can hold the space for them in a very different way. So that's, that's really exciting. So thank you for that. Okay, so let's get into the somatic stuff because okay. I think when I met you, it was like, oh, this girl is really good on the cognitive stuff, but there is some stuff trapped in there, which, you know, we talked about the body keeps the core and all of these things, which, you know, I've been exploring some other things, but... The somatic work is so important. So talk about what, some, what the term somatic means, what that encapsulates, and then talk about the different therapies that tap into that and what precisely they do. Okay. So somatic is simply talking about where you're feeling. I mean, that has to do with the felt experience in the body. That is the actual biological experience of this. Um, and when we think about that, it brings it all back. Um, so there's um, several different kind of therapies that ad address it at that level. Um, EMDR is one of them, um, somatic experiencing, um, brain spotting, um, um, emotionally focused therapy. All of those are addressing that somatic place where the memories are stored. Okay, pause. What is EMDR? EMDR is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And that's what it was called when it was first invented. Um, what, we've, what we now know is that EMDR is more than just the eye movement part that, that, that does the work, that does the um, change for a client. So it is any bilateral movement or any bilateral um, kind of thing that's going on for the client. So with um, EMDR, it's with a light bar and there's a, a light that goes back and forth, or there's a therapist that's able to bring, um, you know, either a pointer or their finger through the visual field, going from one side to the other. And that's, an, that's enabling um, 
um, information to come from one side of the brain to the other. And when um, information is moved into both places, it, it becomes no longer something that is causing a person to stress. So okay. um, I, so there's I, more I, than just. <laughs> I have to pause you. Okay. Cause I know a lot of people who are like deathly afraid of going into therapy. They're like, wait a minute. So this thing is going to go this way, this way. And it's supposed to do what now? I mean, <laughs> I know because I've had therapies, how effective they are. But for someone who is like really reticent and they're like, what are you talking about? This absolutely horrific thing just happened to me and some light therapy is gonna help me or some movement therapy is gonna help me. So I want mm -hmm. you to kind of explain like that part where you said it's moving this thing from this side of the brain to this side of the brain. Why yeah. is that so important? It's really important because um, when information is integrated on both sides of your brain, it doesn't bother us. If it's a, if a traumatic information, traumatic information is stored over in one part of the brain. It's kind of like mm -hmm. your brain gets some really traumatic information and it's like, whoa, what do we do with this? And it kind of sets it over to one side of the brain, locks it down, puts it away, sets it aside and is protected. You're protected, the information is protected and it's set aside. But for it to be processed, it needs to be moved from just from more than just that one side and enables it to go to the other side. And so it's in both places. And then it doesn't cause distress to the client anymore. And it can be done with eye movement. It can be done with sound. It can be done with um, tapping. I mean, I did a lot of EMDR where a person was just touching their, their um their lap back and forth in that same rhythmic kind of way. Um, and it's touching one half and then the other half. And I, the client does it themselves. So it was what, very much in you know um, honoring of their process in that as well. Because at any given point with EMDR, whether they were doing it with the eyes or they're doing it with sound or even with the tapping, it's like, ooh, I don't, you know, maybe this is becoming too much. I can stop it any time I want. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, that's, this, that's a part of it. Okay, so we got the MDR part down. Tapping is becoming, I feel like, a lot more mainstream. I feel like people are talking about it a lot more. And I feel like it's something that people can take on themselves and, like, do to, to like, really maintain. So can we talk a little bit more about why that's so effective? Well, I, I, I particularly like EFT because it's something that a person can learn and then they can bring it with them anywhere they go. It's right. very portable. You don't need your therapist there. You don't need to make an appointment for it. It's something that travels with you everywhere. And once you know how to do it, it's a phenomenal resource that a person can have. Um, and it is tapping, but it's tapping at those um, those spots and it is bilateral because we have a, we have an imaginary line that goes right down the middle of us. And so when you're doing tapping, you're doing bilateral uh -huh. and, and it, you go right down through and it, and it really um, connects with your neurocircuitry. Those are different spots that you have um, there. Uh, I just like ac acupuncture spot, ac acupressure spots. So those are spots where there is, it's like an intersection of neurons in those spots. And so that's why it's super effective. Wow. Okay. And then you talked about brain spotting. Yes. Brain spotting um, has to do with where you look affects how you feel. Um, and when you think about, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one to kind of conceptualize or to understand, but um, when you find somebody kind of, when you, even in your own experiences, you talk about a situation that's very impactful to, for you. I mean, there's normal, like here we're, you know, we try to have good eye contact when we're having a conversation with somebody. But if you're talking about a certain kind of subject, every once in a while we're, we find ourselves, we're like, yeah. And that one time, you know, and your eyes are going there. And it's, and it's a very um, organic thing that happens um, in that experience. And so that is um, kind of how, I mean, 
it's a very boiled down version of how brain spotting works, but it has to do with, with um, connecting where that spot is. I think about it almost like a combo lock that you use with, um, you know, on a locker, on the old fashioned lockers. So we have a, an experience, we can think about an experience, we know there's something that we need to work on. That's the first number. <laughs> and then the second number would be like, okay, where do I feel that in my body? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I think about that thing, I feel it right, maybe in my chest area. So that would be like the second number on a combo lock. And then your therapist would bring a pointer or something, basically a pointer into your visual field and see where it is that you feel that the most. And that's the third number when the lock just opens with that. Yeah, I mean, we're getting down in the nitty gritty of it all because again, I think in the work that I've done so far, when I talk with therapists and counselors about how to get to the healing part of these issues, right? This is where the work is. And we don't have a language for this generally, right? We, we kind of have the, here's the trauma. You know, we, we use the word triggered like 500 times in a day about any number of things, but we are not talking about how to lessen the impact of the negative forces that threaten our vitality as human beings. And so, the fact that a lot of the things that you're talking about that help people recover their agency um, as they are at, after they've experienced trauma has to do with us dealing with things in our body and in our minds where we're sort of, we're sort of focusing, right? And we're tapping, literally tapping into what's in, inside of us and kind of reprogramming and restructuring things is is not a small thing. But you do know, because you're in this field, how reticent people are to actually own that, believe that, and do something about that. So what do you think some of the resistance is with regard to people really getting into that road of recovery and making those commitments that they need to make to go on this journey? Is it, I, I feel on some levels, it's a little bit more than the woo-woo, right? It's a little bit more than that weird and I don't understand it and that's like really out there. What is it about how we are kind of built as human beings that hinders us from being able to say, let me do this really simple thing over and over again. Let me mm -hmm. surrender to what is kind of already the, the divine design of human beings to heal ourselves from things that have kind of gotten us out of, out of whack, out of alignment. Well, I think that you, your question is a couple of different questions. Um, what is it that causes people to not want to go and get help or go and to dive into this sort of thing? Um, I think it has to do, you know, I've got kids, you've, um, we've, we're around kids and we, we remember being a kid and, you know, that when we fall and we just totally just you know, hurt our knee or something like that. And somebody's going to come over and try and help you. And you're like, don't touch it. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't touch it. I think it has to do kind of like that, where this thing that we're talking about is so sensitive and it is feels so vulnerable that we don't really want to necessarily go find somebody to, that's going to go near it who might want to, uh, you know, explore, talk about, dig into whatever, it feels scary. Um, we're talking about trauma here. I mean, it's way more than a skin and knee. <laughs> um, and we feel really protective of those, those things. And, and if we're going to step into it, first of all, what if it doesn't work? Great. I just went and did something that was hard. And now I feel worse. <laughs> Um, the other part here is having um, some control and authority over what, how far they go into it. Um, my, you know, one of the things I love about brain spotting is it's like, I don't have to have the answers. Your neurological system has those answers. And I'm going to walk through this with you until your system processes that and you're starting to feel better. Mm. And I'm not going anywhere until I'm not going anywhere until we're in a place where we're feeling better. 
Um, and that kind of, um, that kind of just connection um, is, is something that needs to be built over time. You can't just walk in somewhere and, and just hope that somebody's going to be able to do that. We have, you know, part of our system is making sure that if we're going to step into something like that, that this person's safe. How do I know you're safe? I just met you, you know? And so people, it takes time um, for them to build rapport around that. You know, I also, I mean, we're talking about trauma writ large right now, but I know also you've done a, a many, many years of, of work around um, sexual trauma. Is, is there a difference between how you handle sexual trauma survivors and other, other people who are dealing with different types of trauma? Sexual trauma is different. I've worked with individuals who have suffered all manner of violent crime. Um, sexual trauma is different. It is different in, in so many different ways that um, relationally, I think it, it impacts a person far longer than other kinds of PTSD. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because when, you know, I'm getting personal here, but when I started to go into therapy and, and started to deal with my own issues and realized what they were connected to, when the sexual trauma was dealt with, it just, it opened up something remarkably different than the other traumas. And um, it's so relational. It's so connected to your sense of um, value and purpose and worth with, within relationship to other people. And because it's so deeply intimate, it does um, complicate how you see yourself vis-a-vis -vis other people be they intimate partners or people who you would naturally trust because sometimes in, in situations where sexual violence is present, you are in a community with people who did not necessarily protect you, right? And who may, may have known and who may have created an environment where that kind of coercive behavior was prevalent. In the difference, um, what is the hardest part of you helping someone overcome their reticence to evolving and healing from sexual trauma that's different from the other types of traumas? I think it, as far as where you, you describe that it, it has an impact relationally for individuals, um, sometimes we have patterns um, in, in our lives that we don't, we can't see until, you know, somebody points them out. And um, sometimes that involves, um, as you get into therapy, examining some of those relationships a little bit closer. And I think there's individuals that know that some of the individuals they have in their life are not necessarily safe people, and they don't want to address that yet because they're scared of losing support, you know, whatever it is, there's some component why they, they feel or reticent to, um, to pursuing therapy and kind of examining how to, how to um, heal from some of those things. Tell me what success looks like for people who are, who are in that place and you guide them to, you know, that newfound agency, that newfound sense of power. Oh, um, Success looks like an individual being able to um, engage in a relationship, like a healthy relationship, whether it be romantic. Um, that's a that's a, one of the things that you know a lot of people will come to me for um, is that they'd like to be able to have a healthy relationship with a romantic partner, um, but that hasn't been within the scope of things that they can do, um, and so that being a huge um, piece, um, a person being able to connect to somebody that, that is healthy and, and um, adores them and um, that's success. Um, be, maybe a person being able to uh, connect with their family in a way that they hadn't been before, um, being able to kind of let down some of their guards and talk to their their loved ones a little bit you know more intimately about you know who they are and I mean so many times you know it's it 
it, it comes around to wanting to just protect oneself from having to feel for certain things. But sometimes um, those connections can be just so therapeutic to be able to just be open and honest um, with a, you know, an adult child, you know, this is kind of the road that I've been through and, you know, it wasn't an easy one, but here we are. And I'm, I'm, you know, grateful that, you know, my healing has brought me to a place where that I can talk about this with you, you know. That is, look, I, uh, I'm really appreciating this part because I think as a survivor, but as also, you know, someone who is very committed to having these conversations, not just for other people who have been through it, but for the people who love and care about us, be they family members or friends or coworkers or just people we are civically and socially connected to. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people don't understand about survivors recovering their agency is that it takes a lot for us to articulate the things that we hoped we hope to experience, that we desire to experience, and that we actually need in the space of our relationships with other people. And that just merely stating that out of our mouths is just ginormous. It's a huge, huge thing. And for people who are in healthier relationships with intimate people, be they family members or intimate relationships, it's like, well, I don't understand that because da, 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 da. like, pause for a second and use radical empathy and put yourself in the space of someone who's had this experience to understand that when someone comes to you to disclose this, when someone tells you that they're in therapy, when someone tells you that they're having these traumas, and for some people it's something immediate like, I was sexually assaulted and this is the immediate after fact when we're dealing with it. Or for many of us, it was suppressed or something we never talked about because of whatever reason. And now we're starting to deal with it. That is such a huge thing. It's ginormous, it's huge, it's huge, it's huge. And so if we're lucky, we are in communion with people who can hold the space for us and say, oh, okay, here's a safe container for you. You know, here's a safe, you know, like it may jar me, it may, prick my consciousness about something that's happened in my own life, right? But I, I will endeavor to hold the space for you. Can you talk a little bit about the space between, I'm coming to therapy, I'm gonna try this, I'm reticent, yeah. to, wow, this is kind of working, to, I have tools and I can get out there in the world and I feel freer, thank you. Like, what do those things look like? Because what I really want to do always is make people understand that accessing this is the greatest gift you'll ever give to yourself or, or the people that you love. And so all of the things that you keep hearing about, like how therapy is so intense and scary and all of these things that are negative and heavy, that that is exactly what it's not, <laughs> right? It is the space that will allow you to, to give you your freedom. So if you could talk about like the, oh, the reticence I'm here and then, the, oh, I'm having some light bulb moments. So, oh my God, I feel free. Like I want people to have an experience of that so that, you know, as we kind of depart from this interview, they're like, oh, okay, it wasn't that bad. Like, I, I think I can consider this. This is something I want to do. Even if I, I thought that I didn't want to do it, I, I, I'm thinking about it now and it, it might take me two weeks, two years, but I, I now have this information. I've had this experience that, that gives me an, an understanding that I didn't have. Okay, so starting with a person coming into therapy on um, their first visit, um, I kind of let them start where they want to start. Um, where, you know, what brought you in here? Um, and then, you know, they either share what they, you know, about what an experience that happened or they go, okay, an experience happened and this is all the ways it's hitting in my life right now. Um, and then kind of, that, that's what the first, that's the first session and kind of what it looks like. But then going forward, um, the next time they come in, we kind of talk about, you know, like, okay, so what's been going on this week? You know, just really that basic, um, how is, how is this previous event that we had talked at about at a different session? How is this now, if, you know, how this last week it's affected your life? And then we kind of look at, okay, so these are some strategies and these are some tools that we can use to make it so that you can handle that kind of a circumstance better next time. Um, 
And then they come the following week and then they're like, whoa, that worked. <laughs> and then, you know, they may go, well, you know, um, I've had this trigger I've noticed that's been coming up around this certain thing. And be like, hey, you feel like working on that today? And then using one of the somatic modalities that I have um, to, to see if, we, if, they, if they're willing or if they're up for it like two or three sessions in I don't like to just do that right out the gate I want to make sure that we've got some good strong rapport um, and that they've also seen their own success in um, the tools that they've learned and how that those are working wow maybe she knows what she's talking about <laughs> um, and then you know three or four months down the line they're like whoa I can't believe when I came in here that all these other, these things were all going on and wow, it's getting way better, you know, and just being, just kind of sharing that space of, of just excitement for how far they've come and, and just even more excitement for, wow, we did that in that amount of time. That was so cool. What else can we do? Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a joy in this that I don't think we talk about enough, right? That, you know, folks know that this effort is about really unpacking some weighty social issues and, and the impact that those issues have on the lives of people, especially when they're unattended. But I am all about attending to them. I'm all about unearthing the people who are attending to them. And I'm all about celebrating the wins. I mean, we got to talk to Blaze on the 10th anniversary of her sobriety, like, what oh, awesome. right so to have someone that says look i went through this <laughs> right <laughs> it was not easy and this is what it was looking like and in going through the discomfort that she often has in sharing her story with other people she has this understanding that like i am doing this because i am helping someone else mm -hmm. is so pivotal and you know when people say to me, you know, oh, our celebrity is going to be involved in this. And I'm like, I fangirl people who do the work, <laughs> right? I fangirl yeah. you, I fangirl Blaze, I fangirl, you know, Keely. Like, I fangirl people who really are, are going into those deep, dark places and then finding the light in those places and then sharing that light with other people and holding their hand as they're walking through it. And I, I have always said this, and I will say it again, and I will probably say it through, you know, the iteration of this project is that you know people who are on the front lines and doing crisis work are, are some of the most sacred human beings on the planet because it is very difficult work um you worked at star for how long almost 10 years right and so you're on the front lines of crisis and so one of the things i always want people to have the opportunity to understand is how you as a human being who has accepted that calling that work how do you process all of that such a good question. Um, um, I have been through hard things in my life. I've chosen um, hard things as, a, as my, my, my work. And in my off time, I tend to do hard things. I like to do triathlons. I like to ride my bike absurdly long distances. Um, and it's just, it's sort of a testament to... I can do hard things <laughs> and I, and I like it. And, and to get through those hard things, to get to the other side of them, it's like, wow, I did that. And it was a lot and dang, I feel great. Cause I got through it. You yeah. know? So for me, you know, being really active physically has been absolutely pivotal in my ability to be able to stay in this field and do this work. Um, there was a few, there was there's been like two times during you know my span where it was just you know something came in and it really did rock my world and it was very difficult um then we lean back on those things that we know work um getting back active again you know uh reconnecting with those individuals who you know bring life back to us and remind us who we are, um, all that, um, just different ways that we know how to, to uh, uh, 
go from dysregulation um, back to re-regulation in, in our own practice um, of taking care of ourselves so we can continue doing this. In closing, what do you want people to know about um, sexual violence and sexual trauma, but just trauma in general, and what they can do to help themselves and other people recover? The kindest, most wonderful thing that you can do for a person is to honor their process and to be there and available for them in any way that you are you find it within your scope of things to be able to, to support a person. Um, and I mentioned it in the first interview and I'll do it here again. Um, it's that unconditional positive regard piece um, that does more than anything else um, as far as in supporting somebody. That means that, you know, the way, <laughs> what's unconditional positive regard? I get asked that one. And that is, that is that person, or I like to think of a person having at least four. Um, and th these are people that you could show up on their doorstep at 1.30 in the morning and you could be knocking on their door and they could come to the door and you've got the full cry face going on and your sleeve wiping the whole bit and they're gonna go, oh my gosh, sweetheart, get in here, come have a seat, I'm gonna fix us some tea Go grab a, there's some blankets. You can grab some clothes out of my, whatever you need. I'm going to, you know, you stay here as long as you need to stay here, you know, and being able to think about like, oh, I've got so many friends. How many friends do I, you know, how many people do you do actually kind of hit that mark, you know, and is, you know, for me, I have, I, I keep, I keep my circle very small, um, but I have. I feel so blessed that I've got four people, you know, that I could do that with. That's somebody who's not going to judge you. Somebody who's not going to be like, what are you doing? And they're not going to throw any shade at whatever's going on for you. They're just going to support you. Um, knowing who those people are and knowing um, that you can show up with them and that they will be there and, 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 a, and an excellent resource if you need them. That's, that's the best thing you can be is, is that unconditional positive regard. That's incredible. And that's so true. Um, we are all lucky to have one, but if we have more than one, we're very, very blessed. So that's 100%. very much. Um, thank you so much for your time today. This is Eden Lunsford. She is a certified trauma specialist and a brain spotting specialist as well. She's the owner of fireweed counseling and wellness and Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I I want to personally also thank you so much for introducing me to brain spotting. When we had our free interviews, you, we had a lot of conversations, and you you shared your gifts with me, and, and they were very very helpful. Um, so it gave me a lot more insight as I was pulling this together, and I got to talk to people who reached out to me from my audience about the show. Um, this is just such important work, and uh, I know that. <clears throat> You will continue to be engaged in this work in your private practice as well. Um, but I'm very, very grateful for the time that you shared with us today. Um, wanted to also let you guys know that, you know, part of this effort is to get you involved in becoming active and engaged. And so there's an engagement page on Amplify America. And you'll see this form on it. You can put your social media name here. You can tell us what issue matters to you. So this week we'll be talking clearly about sexual trauma. And then we ask you to identify people in your own communities, okay? Your own communities who are doing this work. Where are the stars? I love star giving me that. <laughs> the stars <laughs> in your community working around this. Um, what are some of the solutions that your communities are coming up with? You know, there are unique problems that are facing people in Alaska that aren't necessarily the same problems that would face people in your town. So figure out what's happening uniquely in your communities because that really, really, really matters. Um, and then think about the actions, right? What can you do to help? Um, most of these organizations have websites where they will tell you specifically what their needs are. All of them need money. Amplify America needs money too, but all of them need money. Some of them need clothing. Some of them need um, toiletries. Find out what they need. 
and then figure out the, what actions you're going to take. Sometimes your actions don't need to be financial. Sometimes your actions can also be just shouting them out on social media, allowing for their programs to be um, something that you share so that there can be more awareness, showing up um, to their public programs, inviting them to your place of work to give workshops during lunch hours. There are a ton of different ways in which you can bring people in who are doing this work. I want you to not just listen to this podcast or listen to our, our, our ID lives and think, oh, that was cute. You know, I can talk to somebody about it. Oh, this is interesting. I want you to really get involved. I want you to get up out of your seat and actually do something about it. And if that's like having a dinner time conversation with someone or picking up the phone or texting somebody and saying, hey, you should listen to this episode or sending the link to that, that's a part of this. But it's really important that people get involved. And I know sometimes with issues, it can be really overwhelming, which is why we created this sheet. You see, mine is laminated because I'm a type in Virgo. <laughs> so I have my little prior race. I like to do this for every episode, by the way. Um, and it's really important to me that you, you, get, you have the tools to be involved to do this work. Um, and that you, you get delighted and you find people who are actually out there and do that work. And you fangirl or fan guy those people or, or you know, non-binary cheer them, they, um, these folks along. Because it's really important that in the hard things that they do every day, you have no idea how much it means when someone shows up and says, I appreciate what you do. It, it, it's like, sometimes it's better than chocolate. And I really love chocolate, right? <laughs> sometimes it's better than ice cream. Just to have somebody say, oh my God, you put your foot in that. Or, oh my God, I saw what you did. And, oh my God, I know you help 1,400 people a year through some of the most horrifying things that could ever happen to them. So never forget how much capital you have, regardless to whether it's in your bank account or just socially showing up and, and offering your kindness and support to someone else. It really, really does matter. So tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. No, not tomorrow. Wednesday. My week is pushing me on. But Wednesday, we're going to talk to the executive director of STAR, Standing Together Against Rape, um, Alaska, yes. Keely Olson. She's been doing this work for a really long time. Our interview was like super powerful, very, very packed, very, very informative. Um, I am very interested in seeing how things have progressed from a legislative perspective as to things that were happening in, in Alaska. I'm also interested in seeing now that things have been brought to our attention nationally and internationally with regard to um, indigenous Alaskans and, and sexual abuse, how that is, is evolving in that community and how she can inform us on that. So I cannot wait for you to hear about this organization, what they've been doing for over 40 years, and also how they've been a standard bearer nationally and internationally for this issue. So I hope that you will join us. I um, want to say that at the end of this, the thing that I want you to understand the most is getting help for your emotional well-being is a very powerful stance. I know that we have so much heaviness around therapy and who needs to have therapy and who doesn't need to have therapy and are you strong or are you weak and all of these things. And the strongest thing you can ever do is to take care of yourself, um, to take care of yourself, mind, body, and soul. There are so many well-equipped mental health practitioners out there. So many, so many people who wish to help you. So many people who will understand that you don't have the money and will work with you on a sliding scale. Do not allow any stereotype or any kind of limitation um, hinder you from getting the help that you need. <clears throat> and if you go to somebody, and, and I'm going to let uh, Eden Amen this, if you go to someone to seek help and they are not a match, kindly disengage and find someone else. Absolutely. But do not stop. <laughs> you know, I have always fall in the lap of somebody amazing. Maybe because the universe loves me that way. But yeah. let me tell you something, and, and I want you to speak to this even. Like, it, sometimes it takes a couple of tries, and that is okay. You deserve to find someone who honors your experience, who sees you, and makes you feel comfortable as you are exploring these things. So I wanted to put that out there as someone who is the arbiter of this experience, but also as someone who has done it personally, um, how important that is. Eden, did you want to speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. There is, it's kind of like shoes. You, 
<laughs> there are there there's a lot of different kinds of shoes out there and so, you know we look in our closet there's our favorite ones we love them because they fit so well and you know what a good therapist is like finding an excellent pair of shoes and they can take you far it can take you so far i mean i six years plus and i am a, to a totally different person all the better for it and and my people are are enriched by it you know it's not just for me it's also for the people that we love right you know? absolutely it's, oh yeah. yeah this is oh, this is investing not just in yourself but it's investing in those relationships that are important to you so you can show up the way you want to that's exactly right so i am so grateful for you mm -hmm. and so many levels i'm so happy to have met you that you're now a part of my family that i choose um and uh i can't wait to see what happens for you next um, professionally as well. So thank you so much for offering your time and your talent to this effort. And thank you for Amplifying America. All of the people who joined us today, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, this is a baby effort that I'm hoping will expand um, to other platforms that will be a lot more impactful. I need your help to do that. Um, as all of these people have shown up to do the, these episodes of the show, um, they have believed in the effort that I am trying to put forward for you. Um, this show is, is absolutely about making our community stronger and helping the people that we live with have um, lives that they can manage in a, in a better way and healthier way. So uh, if you believe in that, go to our website, amplifyamerica.com. Please donate if you can. Um, we have a patron program where you can donate a little bit of money or a lot of bit of money if you want to a month, or you can give a single donation on a Venmo or Cash App or through Zelle. Um, the again the engagement page is very important to me it's very important that people don't get overwhelmed by what we're doing and they have this kind of lead in to how to become active and engaged and they feel comfortable and confident in the way that they're engaging and how to look at a social issue and parse it out and get the information that they need um <clears throat> other episodes are there um you can send me emails about future episodes that you'd like to see it is my desire to have one episode per state um, that we highlight all, all aspects of our nation to see what's happening on the ground in all of those places. So I have a whole list, you guys, of uh, all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to explore what's happening all over this country with regard to issues and how they affect people and the people who are working to make our nation better. Um, so just keep it, keep me abreast of what is interesting to you. Um, encourage people to follow us, especially on Instagram, because that's going to be our main portal. We also have a YouTube page. If you look up Amplify America, where you'll find these Instagram lives and some of the snippets also from the interviews that I did, um, where you'll see some of the behind the scenes stuff that we worked on. So I thank you so much for joining us today. Eden, I can't thank you enough. Um, oh, hi all for being here today and thank you for amplifying america in any way you can bye now such a fangirl bye thanks bye. <laughs>